Jesus is better than my worries. Better than my anxiety. My worldly desires. Better than my friends. All of my struggles. Absolutely everything. Jesus is mejor que mi guitarra. Jesus is better than my work. Jesus is better than anything I got going on in life. Better than my doubts. Better than my life. Jesus is better than my struggles. Than my insecurities. Anything or anyone in my life. Jesus is mejor que mi dolor. Better than anything we think is good for us. Better than any care. Better than my future plans. Jesus is better than my fear of being loved and accepted. Jesus is better than my mistakes. Um, I want to start with a definition for the word empathy. The word empathy, this is really what we're going to be talking about today. The word empathy means this. It means the ability to understand and share in the feelings of others. Empathy, it's on the screen. The ability to understand and share in the feelings of others. And this, wor this word often gets confused with the word sympathy. We, we sometimes mix up the word sympathy and empathy. Sympathy is a much older word. It's been around since the 1500s. And the idea of sympathy is this. It means feeling compassion, sorrow, or pity for the hardships of another person. That word's been in existence for a long time. But in the 1800s, a German psychologist started referring to this thing in a, the German word is Einfühlung, and it means this, feeling into something. Not just feeling sad about something, but feeling into something. And that's where the word empathy comes from, and it means this. It's putting yourself in the shoes of somebody else. It's not just feeling bad, but it's putting yourself in their shoes. It's understanding where they're coming from. And this just might be the most meaningful quality and the most necessary quality that you and I could ever show in our lives. This might be the... the I, I mean, I think it's very safe to say that the world we live in needs for you and me to show empathy. Not just sympathy, oh, that's too bad, but an empathy. And an empathy as a Christian, it looks like this. It looks like me saying, I'm not going to just feel bad, but I'm going to try to understand why things are the way they are. You know how easy it is to, to you know, it's easy to not like somebody when you don't understand them. But it's hard to not like somebody when you start to understand them. You start to understand somebody and you go, gosh, I kind of, I understand why they did what they did or why they said what they said. In fact, I believe absolutely this is why Jesus said to you and me, pray for your enemies. Because when you pray for somebody, you begin to have empathy for them. You begin to understand them. You begin to put yourself in their shoes and you pray in such a way that you're saying, God, I want to understand what, why they're struggling with what they're struggling with. And when you do that, an enemy becomes, at the very least, somebody you have empathy for. Or we look out in the world and it's so easy, it's so easy to stand back and to just say, oh, I can't believe they would do that. I can't believe they would think that. I can't believe they would say that. It's amazing how much more empathetic we become when it comes into our house. All of a sudden we're like, whoa. And then somebody says, oh, I can't believe they would think that way. And you, you, you know... You're like, well, now I can understand that. I have a family member wrestling with that. I have a friend who's dealing with that. I have a kid who's dealing with that. I have a spouse who's wrestling with that. Empathy is a critical, critical um, expression of the heart of the gospel, I believe. In fact, let's be clear. Jesus has not just been sympathetic towards you and I. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. Jesus doesn't show you just sympathy, but he has empathy for you and for me, and for the whole world. In fact, so much so that the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That, that's, the, that's the ultimate expression of empathy in the world today. That God in heaven, enjoying the just, you know, perfection, would come down because he's under, he wants to understand what it is that you and I are going through. The world needs empathetic people, people who will seek to understand others, not just people who make assumptions about others. And this is the mistake that we can often make. It's that I make an assumption, oh, I've seen this, I've seen this situation before, so I assume this is what's going to happen. But an empathetic person says, I want to understand. The writer of Hebrews is going to push a very strong message on us when it comes to this subject. 
we've been talking about cultural Christianity. And really, the reason that we've been talking about that is because that's what the writer's been dealing with. The, the situation in the book of Hebrews has been this. He's writing, when we call it Hebrews, that means to a Hebrew audience, a Jewish audience. But not Jewish unbelievers, but Jews who came to faith in Christ. And they're, they're, they love Jesus. They've been trying to be a, live a Christian life, but it's been very difficult. The result has been that many of them are now saying, we should go back to our, our Judaism. It was easier to be a Jew than it has been to follow Christ. It's been hard. We thought it was going to be easier, but it's been difficult for us. It's the same thing that happened to the children of Israel. We've been looking at this in the book of Numbers. The children of Israel, they get out of slavery. They end up in the wilderness, and life was hard in the wilderness. They thought it would be easier, and so they complained. They said, man, we wish we could go back to Egypt. Every single one of us has this tendency when we get um, in our flesh, we get in our own head, we get in our own thoughts and our own mind. We don't have the mind of, of Jesus. We have this tendency to want to look back and think everything used to be so amazing. If only I could go back to that time. If only, you know, and we all do this. We all have this time in our life, um, you know, we say, oh, this was the time. This was the season. This is how we did things then, and this was so great. If only we could go back to, if we could go back to that, oh, my goodness, the world would change. But the reality is the world's moving forward, not backward. And Jesus is moving forward, and he wants to reach people, and he wants to reach you today. And so the Hebrew Christians were feeling like life would be better if they went back to Judaism and that's why the writer of Hebrews says over and over, if you think that it was good then, you don't understand how much better Jesus is. And so he writes this book to help them understand that. And today's message, I try to like get a, a theme or a, like what is, that, what is it that we're, we're wanting to accomplish for the morning? And it's this, Jesus' care for you is better. Jesus' care for you is better. If you've got to remember it, write it down. Jesus' care for you is better. No one will care for you like Jesus does. No one will love you as much as Jesus does. Who's married in here? Raise your hand if you're married. Hands up. Married people. Married people. Who wants to get married? Add your hand to that. Who wants to get married? There's four of you. Only four people want to get married. You're like my friends married. No. <laughs> Seen it. No. Okay. Um, Jesus' care for you is better. When Joy and I, when we first got married... We are, our, 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 our parents are very different. You know, I came from a home with um, four kids and, uh, you know, really close in age. And, and, um, and so when one of us got sick, we were quarantined so that we could rescue the rest, you know. It usually didn't work, but it was the idea. And so, you know, when we would get, like, if I got sick, my mom would, you know, Lock, throw me in a room, not like throw me in a room, I'm making it sound like I was a, okay, I was put in my bedroom and the door, you know, just stay in there, chicken noodle soup, of course, and you know, just stay in your room, sleep, rest, get better, quarantined, now Joy's family is different, it was just, it was just two, there was two, she, her and her brother, and so it wasn't quarantine. Her mom um, would, you know, would just wait hand and foot right there, you know, putting the soft, you know, the towel on the head and, and chicken noodle soup, of course, but just, just making sure that she was okay and all. And so then we get married. And I remember the first time that Joy got sick, and I did the most loving thing I could think of. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Just, you know, go to the room, go rest, I'll get you the soup, you know, slide it into the door like a prison cell. <laughs> and, and, and I remember, I mean, I think I remember, you know, she's not feeling good, she's crying, I want my mom, you know, like, because mom, you know, mom, and then when I'm sick and she's trying to wait on me, I'm like, go, go, go away, please go away, leave me alone. I'm used to that, right? Can you imagine this? Jesus' care for you is better than anyone's care could ever be in your life. If, if you're willing to receive from him, what he can do for you is going to be better than what anyone in this world could do. He not only knows what you've experienced, but he knows what you need, and he knows when you need it. Jesus' care for you is better. And the way the Bible is going to say this is this. We have a better high priest in Jesus. 
Now, if you have not grown up in the, in the Christian world, or you haven't been, you know, immersed in Old Testament ideas, then that concept won't make a lot of sense. Remember who the, he's writing to. He's writing to Jewish Christians. They were fully aware of the entire Old Testament. But I, I like to make the, the clarity that not all of us are aware of the Old Testament. And that's okay. And so rather than just kind of speaking about these things like it's obvious, there's a reason that the writer says Jesus is a better high priest, and we want to make sure we understand what he's talking about. Jesus is a better high priest. And you might say today, why do I need a high priest? And you're, you're absolutely correct. According to the Jewish idea of a high priest, you don't need one. Not in the same way. But the writer is going to use an analogy that, is, that parallels from what an Old Testament high priest looked like and who Jesus is in our lives today. The high priest is the one person who had access to God. He was God's mediator to the rest of us. He would go in one day a year and offer a sacrifice for the sins of the nation. So he was the one responsible with making sure you and I were okay with God. But also, he would, throughout the year, he was the one who would speak God's truth to us. So we would be there receiving from the high priest from God. God, high priest, the rest of us. But it also worked in reverse. The rest of us, through the high priest, to God. And so this was a critical role. It was a mediating role. And now the writer of Hebrews says, as great as the high priest was in the Old Testament, the whole function of a high priest... Jesus is a better high priest. And we'll look at this, beginning in verse 14. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. And so here's our first point today. Jesus is a better high priest. Every year, the priest would enter into the Holy of Holies and he would offer a sacrifice in the place where God, God's presence was. It was a one-day deal. One day a year, this person had access to God. But the Bible tells us that Jesus is a better high priest. And here's one of the main reasons why. Jesus has unlimited access to the Father. Jesus does not have temporary access. Jesus has permanent access. Jesus is a better high priest because we don't have to wait 365 days to be able to have a relationship with God. No, through Jesus, we have instant access to the Father. Think about it like this. If you're looking for access to the Father, there's nobody who has an all-access pass like Jesus does. If, you need, if you're looking for access to the Father, Jesus is your man. Jesus is the one. But it's more than just access to the Father. Jesus, our high priest, he's the one who we go to in our needs. He's the one who understands us. He's the Son of God, and he's unlike any other high priest that ever came before. High priests came, and then high priests went. High priests uh, were, were appointed, and then they died. And then another one was brought in, and then they died, and then another one was brought in. Jesus comes, and he is the forever high priest. He is the eternal high priest. This is why the writer adds here, and this is so important, hold fast to your confession. What does that mean? If you grew up Catholic, you're thinking a different way of confession there. It's not what the writer's thinking of. There was no Roman Catholic church at the time. He wasn't thinking that. A confessional I got to go talk to, no. He says, hold fast your confession. What does that mean? Do not give up your faith. If you are on the verge of thinking, it's time for me to move on. I need to try something else. You know, I, I tried Christianity, but it's just not connecting. It's just not working. I thought life would be easier. I thought life would be better. I had a higher expectation of what it would be to be a Christian. The writer of Hebrews is coming to you right now. Okay, 2018, October, he's coming to you right now and he's saying, hold on, don't give up yet. Hold fast your confession. Hold on to your faith. Why? Because the eternal God who became one of us and then died for all of us is on your side. Right now, the God who became one of us and then died for all of us, he is on your side. He is on your team. 
He's for you, and he'll never be against you. I want you to jump with me to chapter 5. So jump with me over to chapter 5, because the writer gives more information as to why Jesus is a better high priest. And he explains the high priest's role and job and even appointment, and then he talks about Jesus. So I want to put it all together in some context. So Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Verse 2, he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So these verses show us how a high priest was chosen and really kind of what his role was. Okay, let's continue. Verse 5. So also, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Verse 8, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And if, by the way, if you're saying, who is this Melchizedek? Or some of you are saying, I know who Melchizedek is. I'm going to put a big pause on the Melchizedek. So just pause on Melchizedek. It's just a fun name to say. I want to say it over and over and over. Okay. But I want to put a pause on who is Melchizedek? What does this mean? We will look at this very soon, but not today. So if at the end of the service you're like, why didn't he talk about it? Now you know why. We'll get to it in the coming weeks. But this passage points us to how much better Jesus is as a high priest for you and me. How much more value we get because Jesus is our high priest than we would ever get if we just had a normal human being as our high priest. And so what I've done is we're going to put up a little side by side here to help you see that this is what the author says. Here's what the high priest is, but here's who Jesus is. And see how much better the high priest is from Jesus. So first of all, in verse 1, he says the high priest was appointed by men. But in verse 5, he says that Jesus has been appointed by God. That's a huge difference. Men appointed the high priest, God appointed Jesus. Secondly, we see about the high priest, that the high priest understands weaknesses because he is weak. But Jesus has power over weaknesses. I don't know about you, but I don't need one more person in my life who understands my weaknesses. I need somebody who can deal with my weaknesses. There's a whole bunch of people that can understand weakness. I need somebody who understands and has power to deal with my weaknesses. Third thing is this. The high priest offered a sacrifice. In verse 3 we read that. But in verse 9 it says this. Jesus, as our high priest, offered himself. How much better of a sacrifice is it? Not that we have one who offered another lamb, another offering. Jesus came, became one of us, and he offered himself as the sacrifice. And it's what John the Baptist referred to when he spoke of Jesus. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus, listen to this, he is both high priest and sacrifice. He's a better high priest because we don't have to ever again offer another sacrifice. The perfect sacrifice has been made. Finally, the writer of Hebrews tells us this, that um, that the high priest was called by God through the line of Aaron. I'll explain that in a minute. But Jesus was called by God through the order of Melchizedek, and I'll explain that in a couple weeks. This is, listen, I'm just, this is fishing. I'm just reeling you in right now. <laughs> Sucking you in. You're like, oh no. And some of you are like, I don't care. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, I really care. So it's good. It's half and half. Okay. Melchizedek, we'll get to him in the moment. But the reason that's important is this. Aaron was of this, it was the family line, right? Aaron is the brother of Moses, and it was that family line through Aaron that the high priests all came from. 
But when Jesus came, and we read about this person that we'll talk about soon, it's a whole different lineage, you could say. A whole different family line. And it's even better than the line of Aaron. And we'll look at that and we'll talk about what that means. So here you can see in chapter 5 a very clear outline of who the high priest was and why Jesus is better. But knowing the facts, which every Jew who read this book knew, knowing the facts and understanding the meaning are two different things. We want to understand the meaning. So go back to Hebrews 4. Go back to Hebrews 4. We read verse 14. Now we're going to get into verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. I cannot tell you, I cannot even begin to explain. Listen, if you have a marker or anything, please highlight that verse. Underline it, memorize it, get it in. Don't just know the words, but please let's begin to understand its meaning. This is one of the most significant passages in the entire Bible. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. By the way, there's a better way to say that. In English grammar, we would say it a little differently. This is what we would call, and by the way, it's the same way in Greek. In the language this was written in, this is what we would call a double negative. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. And that grammatically is not, the, is not the nicest way to say something, but it serves a very important point. The important point is this. It's to overemphasize we have a high priest who is able to sympathize and to empathize with you. And so the writer does that by saying a negative, a double negative. It's a strong way of saying that Jesus 100% understands and cares for you. If there's ever a moment in your life when you feel that Jesus does not care for you, hear this. That idea, that feeling, that thought did not originate from God. Because he absolutely understands and cares for you better than anyone ever will. He made you. He died on a cross to save you. And he is preparing a place for you. Everything that God is doing is for you and for me and for this world that we live in. And so that thought that ever enters our mind, and by the way, maybe on Sunday morning it doesn't, but Monday it does. Sunday afternoon it does. Saturday it does. That thought does enter our mind. Is God for me? It's amazing how quick we move to that place. I've shared that with you many times. The disciples, they were with Jesus all the time. They loved, they loved Jesus. He loved them. He was doing miracles for them. He was doing amazing things. And the one time he fell asleep on a boat that got caught in a storm, they wake him up and they say, don't you care that we're perishing? The first thought in their mind was that God didn't care for them. So you're in good company if that's the first thought in your mind. There's something, there's a, there, that, that sinful nature in us that just gravitates towards this idea, he doesn't care about me. And the Bible emphatically says over and over, he cares about you so much that he laid down his life. The message is that Jesus can understand our weaknesses, not just intellectually, but personally. It's, it's, there's a point where you and I understand people intellectually. I understand the words that they're saying when they're telling me about their struggle. But I may not understand it in a, in a deeper way because I didn't deal with that. We talk about issues that are not yours personally. It's easy to say that we understand the plight of others, but it's really on an intellectual level. I don't know what it's like emotionally, to, to suffer from a lot of things that people are suffering with. I don't know what it's like personally to deal with certain things that people have dealt with. I mean, none of us can empathize with every single person on the planet. If you feel like you've got it worse than anybody else, there's somebody in the world that's got it worse than you. I love the amens because it makes us feel better, right? Seriously, it's a good thing. It's a positive. You are not alone. But here's the other side to that. Here's the other side to that. You cannot, listen, you cannot totally understand other people fully. 
There's, there's people that are dealing with stuff you can't fully understand. You can't intellectually, okay, I understand what you're saying. I understand the words. I got the grammar. I get the idea. But imagine this. Jesus can fully understand and relate to every single human being that's on the planet, past, present, and future. He totally understands. And when Jesus speaks to us about our sin, he does so with the greatest compassion and empathy for our weaknesses. Sometimes, you know, the longer that we're Christians, it's, it's easy, it's wrong, but it's easy to become unsympathetic towards people wrestling with things that we've overcome. So I no longer deal with that, and so I become, uh, I, I lack sympathy for those that are still dealing with that. How can you still be dealing with that? I kicked that issue five years ago. Or even with young people. You know, you've been a Christian for 20, 25 years, and we have expectation that a brand new Christian who's 16 years old should be at the same place that you're at. Aren't you glad nobody thought that when you were that age, right? Do you understand that we, we, we quickly move from, from, you know, we love sympathy towards us, but it's harder to show that sympathy towards others. The good news is this. Jesus fully understands your and my weaknesses. We're told that Jesus sympathizes with our weaknesses as a sinless high priest. He never sinned. And I know that the first thought that many, many people, and I've talked to so many people when I, when I talk about this, they'll say this. How can Jesus, who never sinned, understand my weaknesses? Because he never sinned, how could he understand my weaknesses? And that's a really good question. Because it's assumed, there's an assumption, here's the assumption that we make. I can't fully empathize with somebody unless I had done what they've done. So, right, I cannot, I can't fully have sympathy for a person who's wrestling with drugs because I never wrestled with drugs, there's this kind of idea that, like, unless you did that, you can't sympathize with that. And by the way, I believe that it is a not, it's not a totally inaccurate idea. That was a double negative, too. <laughs> it's not totally inaccurate. So the idea is this. If Jesus never sinned, then how can he even relate to me? And by the way, he didn't grow up in 2018 with the Internet. You know, how could Jesus understand my life when he didn't live in the times I live in, and he never, he never sinned, so how can he know what it's like? But let me say this. True empathy does not come from having done the same thing as someone else. You don't have to do what they did to have a certain level of empathy. Let me read to you, and I'm going to put this on the screen. Charles Spurgeon, a great British preacher, he said this. Do not imagine that if the Lord Jesus had sinned, he would have been any more tender toward you. For sin, listen, please see this, Sin is always of a hardening nature. If the Christ of God could have sinned, he would have lost the perfection of his sympathetic nature. Keep that there for a minute and let those words sink in. Sin is always of a hardening nature. If you think that your past gives you a more sympathetic heart towards people who are dealing with what you dealt with, understand that reaches a limit. That'll peak. But if you have not dealt with the things that other people have dealt with, that doesn't mean you can't have sympathy. The reality is this. Jesus, as a sinless, perfect man, he understands temptation better than all of us. And let me tell you why. Well, with a show of hands, who's ever given into temptation before? If your hand's not up, you're feeling the temptation to raise it. Because it should be. There is not one of us on the planet who hasn't given into temptation. Who better understands the battle of temptation than the one person on the planet who never gave into the temptations? You think you understand temptation? No, you don't. You understand giving into temptation. So do I. You know what you and I are sympathetic towards? Shame, regret, oops. But imagine that you have a high priest who loves you so much. He understands every one of those temptations, but he doesn't deal with shame, regret, and oops. He's, he's looking at you and he's saying, I know what that feels like. He knows it better than you because he never gave in to that sin. 
His heart's not hard at all because he never gave in to that sin. Because sin always has a hardening nature in our lives. How much better is Jesus' care for you than this? He's perfect and he's for you. See, when I think of somebody that's perfect, you ever had people in your life, you're like, oh, they're so goody two shoes, they're so perfect. And, you, and we look at them, we're like, they're, I don't like them because they're so perfect. But imagine it the opposite with Jesus. Just think of it like this. He's so perfect, he can perfectly have empathy for you and me. You want to have sympathy and empathy for your family, for your friends, for yourself, for your coworkers, for this world that we live in, then let me suggest something. It's not going to come through you Googling what those things were like to try to understand it intellectually. It's going to come through a deep, deep abiding relationship with Jesus. And when Jesus loves people through you, you will have empathy. The world does not need our false empathy anymore. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, what the world needs is people who have been infused with Jesus. And we can look at them and we can say, I am truly sorry for you. People who look at, that Christians that look at the world and don't have a judgmental eye in them. The thing about Jesus that is so surprising to me is that people would come to him who were so guilty. The people who did not like coming to Jesus were the ones who were the Pharisees. I, I, my prayer for you and me is that we would be the people that the world would say, I want to be around that guy. I'm hurting. I need them in my life. I'm hurting, and they're going to sympathize with me. I'm hurting, and they're going to be the ones to come around and have empathy. They're going to try to understand, and they're going to love me with this, with this love of God that they talk about. And do you know how many more people you and I will win through empathy than we will through anything else in our lives? Apologetics, great, go for it. You want to win people to Christ, be empathetic towards them. Love them. Love them. And by the way, you already are, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir. Who knows temptation of sin better than the person who resisted it? No one. So verse 16, let us then, Hebrews 4 verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because Jesus is a better high priest who has empathy for our weaknesses, we should draw near to him with boldness. The devil wants you to believe that God is unapproachable. Let me say it again. The devil wants you to believe that God is unapproachable. And sin in us wants us to believe. Listen, the very first time that man sinned in the Garden of Eden, the first thing that they do with God is hide themselves. That is our sin nature. So if you feel the tendency to want to hide from God when you're not doing good, that's totally a part of the, that natural human response. But just know this. Here's the thing. Though Adam and Eve hid from God, God did not hide from Adam and Eve. You might feel and I might feel the need to hide from God when I'm not doing well, but God never feels the need to pull away from you. When you sin, God doesn't say, oh, jeesh got to get away from that guy. They call themselves a Christian. God is not looking to how he can move himself away from you. He's always got this, I'm coming near to you mentality. He's drawing near. The Bible tells us that God is for you. He's going after you. He's not running away from you even if you are to him. Don't believe with the, with the, the devil and even our own human nature wants to tell us that if I'm bad, God is upset. If I'm bad, then God is sad. If I'm bad, then God is distancing himself from me. And the reason I don't want you to believe that lie is because this. You're like, this is not going to be, it's not even encouraging. Here, you ready? We're always bad, the Bible says. <laughs> so if you have a time when you're like, oh man, God's probably distancing himself from me because I'm being bad. God would probably love to come down and say, dude, you were always bad. <laughs> 
Oh, but I went to church. Yeah, you were terrible there too, you know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Inside all of us is we're evil. We're not good people. And I'm not trying to be negative on that. Listen, I don't think that's the bad news at all. The bad news is that we're all bad. The bad news is this, if we don't come to Jesus for healing and for salvation. It's, this is freeing. Do you know how much this will free all your neighbors and your friends and family members? Yes, I'm a Christian, but there's still evil inside of me. I need Jesus too. You know how freeing that is for people to know that you don't think you're better than they are? It's absolutely liberating. It's, and it's so, and by the way, let me tell you this, it's great, it's liberating for yourself. You should try it more often. When somebody says, how could you say that? You could, instead of defending, you just say, yeah, you're right, I'm sorry. Man, that is so disarming. They were ready for a fight. They're like, let's go, we're ready. And you, and you pull away, you're like, oh, you're right, I'm a bad guy sometimes, sorry about that. And God doesn't love you and I because sometimes we're good. He loves us because we need him. And imagine this, we make God look good because he's loving something that's so not good. And that's the good news. The confidence that you have or that you can have is this. I can go boldly to a high priest who is for me. I can go boldly to the throne. I can come boldly because of the cross. God loves me so much, I do not need to hide from him. If I'm doing wrong, he is the one that I should run to. He will not shame me. He will not, you know, just be there to make sure that I know how, what a loser I am. Everything around me is doing that, including me. But God will never do that. He draws us in with his love. The Bible says he loves you with an everlasting love. You are the treasure, Matthew 13 tells us, that it was worth dying for. You are so valued by God, he was willing to die so that he could get you. When a king referred to their throne, they did not refer to their throne as a throne of grace. That's what the Bible says here about God's throne. That you could come boldly to the throne of grace. Kings didn't refer to their thrones as thrones of grace. Do you remember in the, and if you don't, no problem, but in the book of Esther in the Old Testament, Esther's married to the king. But the rule was this, if you want to get to the king, you have to be invited by the king. And she made an attempt one time to go to the king without having been invited. And the penalty, if the king didn't want you, was death. And we're talking husband and wife here. Yeah, that's a rough relationship. Be encouraged in your marriage today, friends. <laughs> Just imagine that. And so Esther, with real fear, kind of timid, comes forward. I'm sure everybody in the room kind of gasps, like, oh my gosh, she's coming in without the invitation. Let's see what happens. And of course, in the story, the king welcomes her in. He receives her. And, and let me say this. The story of Esther and her husband, the king, is, that's not a throne of grace. People didn't run in there going, yeah, it's so good to be here. You came in with fear. You came in with reverence. You said what you said and you got out of there. And that's how so many people are treating God's throne today. Say what you got to say and get out of there. But that's not the throne that God is sitting upon right now. And what does that even mean? It means this, the power, the, the, the power in the place where God is at right now is a place of grace. Years and years ago, Joey and I and a whole bunch of our friends from our, the Bible College in Hungary, we went to Rome. And, you know, it's like an hour flight over to Rome. We spent the weekend in Rome and, and we were like, let's go over to the Vatican. And if you've ever been to that area, it's a big, beautiful, there's this huge open square um, and we, were th we, we got off of the metro and we were walking there. And as we're walking there, there were thousands of nuns and priests from all over the world. Thousands, and no exaggeration, 10 to 15,000. And so we were kind of creeping our way along. I'm the one that likes to, and, and so I was climbing up on pillars and taking pictures like, dude, when are you ever going to see like 10,000 nuns? You know, this is awesome. <laughs> And it was beautiful. They're all in their different garbs of every different group and everybody. And we didn't know what was happening, you know. And, um, but it was just beautiful. And next thing I know, we're kind of taking some pictures and all. Next thing I know, the guard behind us opens the doors to the Vatican. And we got swept up by 10,000 nuns and pushed into the Vatican. 
A buddy of mine who, um, a buddy of mine before he goes, man, I haven't been picked up by people since the Led Zeppelin concert I went to years ago, you know. And, you know, we just got moved by these nuns, and they were all really nice, like, ah, you know, and we all just kind of moved forward. We went through metal detectors, and we ended up in the Vatican sitting a few rows back from the front, and we're sitting in there, and we're like, what is going on? Well, Pope John Paul II was going to be doing the Mass. I never been to a Catholic church in my life. Which is cool when you live in Europe and you're telling, when you're talking to people about the Lord, and they're like, oh, I'm Catholic. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've been to the Pope. Pope did the Mass for me. You know, it's a great inn. It's not true, but okay. So power. I'm pointing this out because when the Pope finally came in, he came in this little cart, you know, and he was quite old at the time, and he comes, and there was power all over. Everything about that room said power. Everything. Power. Power and keep your distance. You know, you got the Swiss guard and they're kind of dressed in the, you know, if you've seen the guys in the, the cute outfits, you know, you go, oh, they're so cute. But they're not cute. They're, they're mean and they're strong and they're powerful and they're very good at what they do. And their job is to make sure you don't get too close to the Pope. But imagine, imagine that's not God's throne. And I'm not making a judgment on Catholicism. That's not my point. I just had never seen anything like that. I'd never seen such power but imagine this. Imagine that God's throne is a place where he's saying, get over here. Get in here. And somebody standing on the side, and the Lord would see that, and he'd say, get over here. Come on. You belong here. The throne of grace is a place where you belong. If there's anything in you that says, I need to pull away from God, just know that's not from God at all. He understands you. Oh, he doesn't know what it's like to deal with this kind of an addiction. Yes, he does. He just never gave in to it. His heart is still soft for you. He knows what it's like. He just never gave in. You don't need another person who understands shame. You need a person who understands forgiveness. You don't need another person in your life who understands the same regrets you've dealt with. You need a person who has power to forgive. It's not enough to have somebody who understands regrets. We need people we need someone, and there's only one, who can forgive you and who has the power to change you. And so my question for you is this. Will you come to the throne of grace? I'm not talking about a particular place, so to speak. Sure, God's throne, the Bible tells us, is in, in heaven. But that throne of grace that the writer of Hebrews is talking about, it's not a, it's not a place, it's a position, it's not a place, it's a position. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you don't have to climb Everest. You don't have to, you know, swim the seas and climb, you know, and fight through the deserts and kill the giants and do all these things, you know. No, it's a position that you choose today. You say this, I am choosing to position myself in the place of God's grace. It's as if there's this waterfall of grace and you are standing there, and you have the ability right now to just come and get immersed in that. To just receive love. To receive kindness. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up, and, and I want to emphasize this point just to, for another minute. And we're going to worship the Lord together. We've got the elements of communion. Listen, maybe your first step today is this. Maybe, you're, maybe some of you are saying, yeah, but I'm dealing with shame. Then deal with the shame. Don't say you're dealing with the shame. Deal with the shame. You want to know how Christians deal with shame? We come to the table. We come up to the table. The Bible says, examine yourself before the Lord. If you got shame, then you come to the table and you hold the elements. Well, you move out of the way so other people can get the elements. But then you hold those elements and you say, Jesus, you were broken so that I don't have to be. Jesus, you died so that I don't have to. If you're dealing with shame or regret, then can I beg of you, deal with it. Right up here at the table. Deal with it. And then move forward. Move forward. Because grace in your life is not putting a thumb on you to remind you of who you were. Grace comes and holds you up and says, this is who you are in Christ. Stop seeing God trying to hold you down. Start seeing God lifting you up. And if you're being held down, it's not God. 
God's not doing that in your life. Come to the table and then leave it there. Even encouraging you as we worship the Lord and as we take communion, maybe you need to stay up here to be able to receive from the Lord. Just stay up here and let's worship the Lord together. You know, pews are fine, but pews are meant to be gotten out of eventually. And we want to worship the Lord. We want to embrace God's grace. Let's pray. Thank you so much for watching us today here at Calvary San Diego. We're so glad you took the time to be with us in our service. We'd like to encourage you that if you would like to see more of our studies, you can do so at our website. And we also want to give you the opportunity there to give if it would be in your heart to do so. You can do that at our website, calvarysd.com giving. We'd love for you to partner with what God's doing here in San Diego. God bless you guys.